Uh... Man, what a great month November was to me. I got a new haircut, some new Switch games that I got for my birthday, and plus, some great albums that came out too. I bet nothing could ruin this month for me. Okay, maybe a new variant. Or this new Adele album, which I'm seeing some people saying it's one of her best. No! No! The biggest positive outcomes that I took from this record is that I do appreciate how some songs in here have a very particular flavor that reminds me of the vocal jazz of Sarah Vaughan, and this is pretty nifty. And also the lyricism in here have some pretty high points, especially on the best track, and the other positive highlights have a pretty strong presence instrumentally. But that's pretty much all I can truly say of good this record has to offer. The core of this record is some of the most stale songs Adele has recorded since her debut. Some songs are boringly repetitive, and most tracks totally fail to get you hooked into them. And this especially sucks for me, because I'm a huge fan of Adele, and I always defend her work dearly. But for this one, yeah, there isn't much to defend here, besides its intentions. Easily Adele's weakest album, and the pinnacle of wine mom music to me. Which is fitting, considering one of the songs in here is literally called I Drink Wine. Well, 59% I guess. Hell yes. I want Terrence Martin to produce my life now. This is one hell of a smooth R&B album, with tasteful production and many great songs. It's not as great as Dinner Party was, but we do have some tracks that are part of the material of that record. And sure, the second half is a bit duller, but even there I still found something to enjoy. I guess the only moments that the record truly leaves to be desired is in the negative highlights, but even with those in place, I still think it's one hell of a strong record, and a great step up from Velvet Portraits. Mr. Martin, for the love of all that's most sacred in this universe, Accept this wedding ring I offer you. And also accept this 84% superb score. Bam, 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 bam. Top 10 reasons why the new Silk Sonic album is good. Number 10. Uh, number 9. And finally, number 1. It's good. Please subscribe. It's impossible to deny that this new Silk Sonic album is one of the best albums of the year. It's a soul record with tons of flavor, smooth compositions, and lyrics that are a bit hit or miss to me. I do really like it, but it's not a particularly unique project. It is what it sets up to be, and maybe because of that, it's not a record that I'm necessarily crazy about. Sure, the highlights are absolutely insane tracks, but even among the standards of this record, I don't really feel like this is an album that makes me want to listen to it again, considering it's also kinda one note. Again, it's definitely a really good record. But to me, I feel like something's missing to make me fully connect with it. The score is still pretty high though, 80%. Considering the rave reviews this album has been getting, I was pretty excited for this, but no. I'll stick to Violent by Design and call it a day. Is it just me, or Vinny's rapping is seemingly getting worse with every new release? His flows here are exactly what you would expect from him, but in a very mediocre way, and his signature one-note aggressive delivery sounds completely stale in this album. It's like he is too much in his comfort zone, to the point that he forgets how to try. Another point that really got me confused here is regarding the production. It's rudimentary and limp, which is something of extreme concern, considering that often the best part of a JMT record is Stoop's insane production. Even him sounds like he doesn't want to be there. I mean, fair enough. This album is way more cohesive than the group's previous ones, and there are some pretty nice songs in the middle of the tracklist. But pay attention, the best song of this record is an interlude. That's already a sign that things are going in a sour direction here. And honestly, this makes me more excited to an instrumental stoop record than another JMT record. But who knows, maybe this can grow on me, and even though my review was pretty negative here, this album is not that bad. It's more like I'm too disappointed to point out anything but the weak points in here. Eh, I don't know, I'll keep returning to it and see if this thing clicks in the future, because right now, this is not the best look. Negative highlights, 62%. If you're not familiar with Hit, she's mostly known as the lead singer of Cutie, which, considering that background, I was expecting something similar to that. And that's exactly what we got. And it was great. I'm glad to see that after so long she would show up with an EP that even though it's short, it can certainly pack a punch and showed that she has enough balls to sustain a potentially great discography. The songs in here are a pretty competent blend of electropop with elements of glitch and deconstructed bass. That is a bit too mellow to call hyperpop, but also too abrasive to call it regular pop. And usually, these midterm cases tend to be a bit lackluster, but she shows such charisma and personality doing this, that this is not at all the case. Truth be told, all the songs in here are good, but there is one clear winner which is the best. 
and I'm pretty excited to see what Hade will bring to us in the future, especially if it's in an album length. This is one hell of a great start for her solo career. No negative highlighting here, and 84% superb is the score. The first time I listened to this thing, it drove me almost insane. I legit thought I was going to give this album 100%, but on subsequent listens, I realized it was not that. But this is still one of the best records I've heard this year. This album feels like the prodigy song of Ornette Coleman and Pharoah Sanders, blending the chaotic compositions of the former with the spiritual passages of the latter. And while there is one specific weak spot, the rest of the album is completely amazing. It's one of the most genuinely relentless experiences I've had all year. Especially when we talk about the positive highlights that are absolutely hysterical. This is possibly the best jazz album to come out in recent memory. And with music like this coming from these guys, we need to keep all eyes on what Ear Considered will offer to us in the future. Because they just proved to us they are one of the big leagues now. Yeah, I guess this is the album of the month. But I feel like an even bigger compliment is the score I'm about to give those records. 98%. Can we just agree that Taylor is probably at the best point of her career so far? Not only she released two great records last year, but now she's remaking past records of her, and improving them in almost every way. The original Fearless was good, but Red was better. The new Fearless was great, and the new Red is even better. It's actually impressive by how similar these songs are to the original ones, yet they managed to be so much more striking than those. The production of course is the main reason for that, much less dated, and it made me click with songs that previously I didn't care much about, such as State of Grace. Taylor is really outdoing herself here, and I am so excited to see how the next installment of this series will sound like. So far, Red is her pinnacle, but who knows how it's gonna be in a few years. Well, in any case, here are the many highlights of this record, followed by the subtle score of 86%. I don't wanna call this album soulless, but that's exactly what it is, it's about a soulless as an NFT monkey. Fun enough, Wolf Mother was one of my favorite bands back in high school. Back then, they just had put out Victorious, which was in my view one of their best records, and it still is. So this made me very excited to see what they would put up next in the future. But then, in the very end of 2019, and I mean that literally because it was the last day of the year, they put out Rock and Roll Baby. By that time, I was already a less active listener of theirs, but still I was like, oh no. This new record is somehow an even more stale product than Rock and Roll Baby was. With muddy and monotonous production, songs that are repetitive as all heck, and nearly all have the same song structure, and weak ass lyrics. But this last one, I wasn't surprised, since even back in their day, they had some pretty shitty lyrics. But god, this feels even worse. Like a pack of songs made in 15 minutes, purely by contractual obligations. Which is funny, considering this album was released independently. I guess there were some shards of alright moments toward the middle of the tracklist, but honestly nothing that special. This is easily Wolf Mother's weakest output, and I'm seriously concerned about their future. Or better saying, Andrew Stockdale's future. Here come the irrelevant negative highlights, and the score here is 38%. Alright, so out of all the albums that I decided to review for this month, this is by far the least known one. And this to me only shows how the musical landscape is unfair, because this thing is terrific, and it's possibly the best prog rock album of the year. The compositions in here are rich, and are constantly showing a new size and singular sound, a key element to make a record like this stand out. Plus the lead singer has such a strange charisma to his voice, it's like a hybrid between the goth existentialism of Nick Cave and the ethereal performances of Tom Alexander from Hallas. And these are especially demonstrated by the positive highlights. The only true downside of this album is that the production doesn't follow how epic this album is. An album with such concepts needs to have a production that feels triumphant and lush. Like Tales of Mystery and Imagination, but the one in here feels tamed in comparison. If it had a more lush sound, this could certainly be among my 10 favorite albums of the year. Which is not too far away from that, so I guess that's not that big of a problem. The score I give to this is 87%. I kinda don't know what I expected coming into this, but for some reason the idea behind this project intrigued me, to the point that I'm now reviewing it. Not that I've done that, I can say this thing is simply mediocre. The production is pretty mixed, there are definitely some stronger moments, but there are definitely some clunks. Jesus Christ, what a tiresome project this is. I spent a good chunk of my listens throughout this thing just begging for mercy. Luckily the album gets some grip towards the end, which helps lift the score of the album a bit, but still, no. I don't think I will return to this project ever again. 46%. Even in her outtakes, she's killing it. Megan, please never stop being you. For a project that is mostly outtakes and demos, 
this is surprisingly great. If you liked Fever or Good News, this will very much be another great dose of Megan being Megan, with amazing, super entertaining flows, potent beats, hilarious lines, and everything that makes her my favorite equine since Spirit. Even though, I will admit there's a reason why those are outtakes. Because they indeed are a tad weaker than what Megan usually puts out. There are definitely some standout moments, but the low points are indeed pretty middling, and there is also the issue that the further this mixtape goes, the more jaded it feels. So yeah, it's like a less potent good news. Again, it's definitely not bad. I really like it, in fact. And my conclusion out of this is largely positive, but it's not as essential as Megan's other work. Still, if only other artists could have outtakes that are this solid. Also, it's funny to me how this raunchy ass mixtape ends with such a wholesome track. God, Megan's really one of a kind, I love her so much. <laughs> uh, anyway, positive highlights, negative highlights, and a score of 77%. I'm very happy for Summer Walker to have such a strong debut on the charts, and I hope that only great things come in her path from now on. But I would be lying if I said this album is amazing. I believe it's a pretty straightforward but well-produced trap-influenced R&B record. Not a lot of variations, and not much to really grab you, which makes the runtime of the record of over an hour feel kinda exhausting. There were some tracks that I did enjoy considerably though, and I do believe Walker has the potential to release a really good project in the future. It's just that this ain't it. Negative highlights, and the score? is 62% superb. Nah, not pulling that off on you, this is their best album since the 90s. Well, Limp Bizkit's back, sounding pretty much just like they always did, like huge douchebags. But at least they are now self-aware. I kinda don't know what else to say, it's just a more sarcastic version of their sound, and while to some extent that helps you improve the record, there's a still a good ton of Bizkit's signature cringiness in a good chunk of the songs, especially in the negative highlights. And for the conclusion, yeah, it's fine. Pretty much the highest you can expect from Limp Bizkit these days. But I'm not sure if it actually means much. Maybe. Life is a mystery, and Limp Bizkit is just one of the enigmas I have to decipher. There is the positive highlight, and the score of 67%. Not that I graduated in School of David Boy Arts, I feel pretty comfortable reviewing this album. And the first thing I have to say is... What on earth is this album cover? If anything this album did accomplish, Instead, it stole the title of reality as Bowie's worst album cover. At least that one didn't look like the villain of a knockoff horror movie. Now, musically speaking, considering the era this was made, I was expecting it to be way more similar to Heaton, but I do see how this one evolved into that. The main thing I gotta say about it is that it doesn't feel as focused as other Bowie records are. There are definitely some great tunes, but it feels more or less pretty underdeveloped, which makes sense. With that said, I think I'm still a bigger Heaton fan, and I'm more likely to return to that one. But this one is also pretty good. If you want some more Bowie music to spice up your evening, this will do. And in my Bowie ranking, I'd probably place this between The Next Day and Buddha. So, 73%. The Swedish are coming! The Swedish are coming! I've been waiting 40 tough years. I know I may be only 20 years old, but since my past life I've been waiting for this moment. And I'm pretty sure my first words in this new life were, so when's the new ABBA dropping? And at last, my prayers were answered. And at this point, I am so happy that it's finally here that I'm not even upset that it's not that great. I mean, it is still pretty darn good, let the positive highlights speak. But I think that I personally wasn't a fan here is that the album is mostly focused on ballads. And sure, ABBA has always managed to make some pretty good ballads in the past, but I personally would like to see more of the dancer tracks like Gimme Gimme Gimme, Waterloo or Take a Chance on Me. And plus, the sound of this record feels kinda watered down in comparison to what the band has done in the past. It's still pleasing, but it's not exactly as memorable and hooking like their music used to be. I guess I was already expecting it, so this helped to remedy that. This, and also that all the songs in here really please me. Well, almost all of them. Still, I'm just happy to see one of my favorite artists ever to release something new after so long. I can now die in peace. This album is 77% superb, and see you in heaven, folks! Before I make my transition to the other plane, here is the monthly collage. Okay, now I can go. See ya!